Hello. <laughs> Hi. Awesome. Hi, Hannah. Hi, Hannah. Hello. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and screen share so we can jump into the slides. All right, so thanks to everyone who's joining and for those of you that are watching after the fact, we do free workshops about every month now. We're on a, a streak of doing, done about five or six so far. And yeah, we just want to bring um, more education around nutrition for IBD because this is the most confusing part, especially for people who are newly diagnosed or um, it can be very, there's lots of conflicting views and information online, and we want to help you in terms of narrowing it down to what's really important and giving you the stuff that's actually going to yield results. So um, I'm Ashley Hurst. So for those of you who don't know us, we're Crohn's and colitis dietitians, and we help Crohn's and colitis dietitians, Crohn's and colitis patients with symptom reduction and finding answers. So Rebecca, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Hey, everyone. My name is Rebecca. Um, if I haven't met you yet, I am a registered dietitian with Crohn's and Colitis Dietitians and uh, here to talk about what to eat for IBD without triggering symptoms. And we'll also have some time for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, um, if you want to type it in the chat so you, so you remember it, you, you can do that. And then when we get towards the end, we'll go through all your questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so just to kind of start off with, with today's uh, webinar, um, we wanna first focus on what we know about nutrition and IBD. So what we know is that there is not one specific diet that will fit everyone's needs. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but in particular, it's because the disease activity and location of the disease can vary from person to person. So if your IBD is located in the ileum versus the large intestine, the colon, um, then there's gonna be some sort of differences there. Same if, you know, if, if a person has ulcerative colitis and their location is specific to the rectum area versus the distal or descending colon, um, that's going to be different compared to somebody who has extensive colitis. So everyone is going to be extremely different. Even if you have the same diagnosis, it's, it's different in general. Um, an individualized approach is really going to be the best. And in this pattern, we're able to understand someone's tolerance with specific foods, deficiencies. So just because you have ulcerative colitis, and the reason why I'm bringing up UC is because Rectal bleeding is a common symptom. And so we see a lot of iron deficiency with anemia, but just because you have rectal bleeding doesn't necessarily mean that you become anemic. And I see it all of the time. So, you know, everyone is different. And that's also another reason why there is an individualized approach. Um, symptoms can be different. Inflammation, as we mentioned a little bit earlier can be different and other important factors. So everyone's IBD is so incredibly different. There's also no quick fixes. So IBD, there's no quick fix with IBD. We know that it can be very unpredictable and we know that things can change over, over time. So it's not consistent, right? It's kind of like a wave in the ocean. You get this, this creeping up, creeping up and then coming down where you get to just kind of relax for a minute and then it kind of comes up again and then it kind of comes down again. So, you know, it's really unpredictable and, and that's why, you know, it's, it's important that your nutrition is catered specifically to you. Um, there is conflicting information that's provided to us at diagnosis and throughout our journey. I know that, you know, I can relate to hearing low fiber, low fiber, um, and we'll see as, as we keep going why actually fiber is crucial for, for our treatment. Um, and working with a team that specializes in IBD can be so incredibly helpful throughout your journey. And to add what you said about the fiber, you and I were talking recently about how, um, 
it's not that either pro it's not like one or the other. It depends on what your goal is. Right. So like low fiber might be good temporarily to, you know, help with symptoms or depending on what complication you have, but then it's not great in the context of long-term. So it's, it's mm-hmm. less about having polarizing views there and more about like, just, it depends on where you're at and what you're trying to do. Yeah. That's a really good point. That is, that's very true. Cause there's always a time and need for specific nutrients. So it's never just all an all or nothing approach. That's, that's really important to remember. So this is a diagram just showing a little bit about um, IBD and the different types of IBD. So Crohn's you see on the, on the left, it's kind of like it, it, the way that it's, that it presents itself is kind of patchiness or, or skip lesion. So they kind of, you see patches that kind of occur anywhere from the mouth to the anus. That's, that's where Crohn's can be located. So it's really anywhere within the digestive tract. And then you have ulcerative colitis, which is really more specific to the large intestine, which is the colon. And there are many different terms to describe ulcerative colitis. Um, colitis is kind of that, that umbrella term where, you know, depending on where the location is of your UC, that kind of defines the type of diagnosis that you have. So there's left-sided, right? There's extensive, there's pancolitis, there's proctitis and so forth. So a lot of different forms in that, in that respect. Um, we know that symptoms can be very similar between Crohn's and UC. And then we also have a different type of, of IBD, which is microscopic colitis. And we have uh, lymphocytic and we also have um, collagenous, coll- collagenous colitis. Um, so those are really the two different types of microscopic colitis. Yeah. And that one's less common and, and it can often go missed because like its name, it has to be seen under a microscope. So sometimes people, sometimes that one goes undiagnosed for longer because it's, you know, you have to really be looking for it. Yeah. And what's really interesting to you guys is that a lot of times, so doctors, GI, gastroenterologists will still do colonoscopies without taking a biopsy and they'll say, Oh, it looks totally fine. I don't see anything, but you have all these symptoms and they may just say, oh, you probably have IBS, right? And that's actually really common to misdiagnose microscopic colitis with IBS. And also even celiac disease can kind of um, occur simultaneously with microscopic colitis. So something important to, to look out as well. Yeah, this has happened to like a lot of our, a lot of our patients and it even happened to my sister this month on um, kind of it did, these things just get missed. And this is why it takes years sometimes to get diagnosed, or it could be like early stages too. So has this ever happened to you? You were dismissed when you asked for nutrition support from your GI, you were told nutrition doesn't matter. You sought support from forums or Facebook groups. You were confused about what's true and especially what's true for you. Do you often feel like everything is conflicting and aren't sure where to start. No nutrition must matter, but are searching for clarity on where to find help. And do you feel like everything triggers symptoms? So yeah, I can definitely relate to all of these things. (laughs) Um, Definitely have been there before. Ashley? Yeah, this is kind of like the progression. Like I hear this all the time when I talk to people um, is kind of like that same it's the same process. And we kind of end up with, oh my gosh, where do I go for answers and for getting support? Um, it can be very isolating too. Cause it's just, sometimes we're just not heard or seen as IBD patients just from, you know, nothing's visible. So it's like, how do we know, you know, we're just seen differently. Um, so it can be hard and we're really trying to fill, fill this gap a little bit and make it a little bit easier. So mm-hmm. yeah. Anybody else type in the chat, if that sounds like you or kind of what the journey has been like for you. I don't even have the chat up, but I don't think we have any yet, but I'm, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. Um, yeah. So here's, here's kind of the facts. So, you know, I know a lot of us were told nutrition doesn't matter in IBD, but we know, and I was told that too. Um, even when I was in school studying how nutrition does matter for IBD. Um, so, but we know a lot more than we did 10 years ago. A lot has happened. There's a lot more research, a lot, we know about the gut microbiome and that's role in IBD. 
Um, but we know it does play a role. It's just not a cure, you know, so it does play a role and it's an important part of uh, treatment for sure. And it can mitigate a lot of risk and help you with symptom reduction. Um, and that's the part that I think a lot of people don't know about is just how powerful it can be in that symptom reduction part. Um, you can get symptoms under control, even, even when you've got a really bad flare, we can often have symptoms reduce, um, even when you have inflammation present, and we can also focus on that inflammation piece. So there's a lot that nutrition can help with, especially when it's combined alongside medication, we just see really good results with that combo. So we know it plays a role in the development of IBD. So this isn't, it's not cause and effect. It's not like, um, it, there, there's also not a lot that we all have control over when it comes to that. I mean, think about your childhood or your teen years and what you had access to at the first school lunches. Like there's so many variables to this. So it's not, it's not coming from a place of guilt or blame because, um, you're where you are financially, what you grew up with, like all of those things are completely pretty much out of our control. Um, and if you were an eighties kid or a nineties kid, you know, we definitely had a lot of risk factors. Um, most of us did, I would, I would say, um, but yeah, it can play a role in development, but it's not the only factor. There are things like antibiotic exposure, um, history of IBD, your heritage, um, your deficiencies like vitamin D can be involved in that kind of, um, beforehand, you know, type of factor. So, uh, diet does play a role in a major role in symptom reduction. So we utilize nutrition and dietary strategies to help people with reduction of diarrhea, um, uh, getting more normal bowel movements. Cause not everybody has diarrhea. Some people have more of that constipation type, um, symptom. So we help a lot with that. You, it can also help with bloating. So we can see significant decreases, um, with things like bloating and abdominal pain too. And the other big factor is fatigue. So, um, fatigue can come about, about a number of different ways, like deficiencies or even just intake. So not having appropriate intake can, can lead to kind of more of that fatigue. So oftentimes in IBD, we, we do a lot of restriction, uh, because of fear, because we're afraid of triggering symptoms. But if we can help you with getting more clarity around what really matters, it will help you liberate the diet a little bit more so that you're getting enough and you're not less likely to have some of that fatigue. But then there's also nutrients like iron and vitamin D that play a major role in that fatigue. And then we do know that certain foods can decrease the risk of flares and some can increase. And we'll talk a little bit about that today and kind of where all of this thought process comes from. And we know that nutrient deficiencies and malnutrition can increase the risk of complications and surgery. And even your, it can be involved in the part of your recovery from those things too. So recovery from surgery, nutrition is very important for that. And then some nutrient deficiencies are correlated with severity of flares. Um, we know that to be true, especially with vitamin D. We also know that 30, 30 to 40% of us with IBD are often low. So it is one of those things that, um, you want to make sure you're checking on a regular basis, you know, every, at least every year, um, especially in the winter months, if you live up North or you're not getting a lot of sun, it is a good thing to check on. And if you've been low in the past, you're probably going to want to do it a little bit more frequently, like every six months and some other things we know. So it's actually the first line of treatment for pediatric Crohn's. So, uh, you know, IBD is most commonly diagnosed between the 25 and 35, but we've definitely seen a rise in pediatric IBD. And even in our practice, we've seen a lot more um, pediatric patients come up and, you know, the first line treatment at that age is really to, to do more of a nutrition protocol first in lieu of even things like steroids. So because of the age in you know, pediatric patients, we don't want to expose steroids unless absolutely necessary because it can affect, um, growth and all of that. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different treatment options for, for that with, with nutrition alone that can be as effective as barnazone, which is pretty cool. Um, and we can see that a lot with, um, with our older, older patients too, even in teens. And then with it, the other really important factor when it comes to nutrition is diversity. So there was a study 
I want to say seven years ago, it was the largest microbiome study that was ever done. And it looked long-term at um, factors involved in gut health. And one of the biggest factors they found was di that diversity is really important. So having diversity in the diet, lots of different flat, uh, fibers and plant compounds and colors in the diet, that was the differentiating factor between people with really good gut health and less symptoms and people with poor gut health. Um, and that's a huge challenge for people with IVD because diversity is hard because we're trying to mitigate symptoms. And even if you have the knowledge of diversity being important, it's still a challenge to trust yourself and trust your body. Um, I can tell you that from experience because I understand this from an intellectual standpoint, but uh, when there's a flare involved, it does bring up a lot of fears and a lot of challenges with kind of moving through that and feeling comfortable. So know that you're not alone. If that part scares you, <laughs> I think it scares all of us with IBD. Um, especially if you're haven't included lots of fiber, you're still kind of afraid to adjust the diet. And something that we know is that those that keep fiber in the diet are 40% less likely to have flare ups. You've probably heard me say this on Instagram, if, or if we've talked on the phone, this is something I tell everybody because it's, I think it's so important because it's probably one of the things that is least talked about. In fact, I think we see more of the opposite. If you're searching online, even places like the Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic might recommend a diet lower in fiber. Um, and like I mentioned in the beginning, it's not that they're, it's not that they're wrong. We're just looking at what outcomes. So this study looked at inflammation reduction and redu reduced risk of flares with fiber. And we know that's true because what happens is um, fibers really feed up our helpful gut bacteria. And then they reward us by giving us something called butyrate and butyrate, what it does, it's something called a short chain fatty acid. And it does a lot of things in the body, but what's most important for you to know is that it helps reduce inflammation. And it's one of the key indicators of nutrition success in IBD is being able to produce more butyrate. Um, that's what a lot of the studies look at. So you do want to make sure that we can expand the diet. And if fiber is scary for you, we'll talk a little bit about how to, how to mitigate some of that, some of the fears and some of the symptoms that come about with fiber. And IBD patients often struggle with including diversity, fear of triggering symptoms. We know that's true. And then, you know, the other component to this is that 80% of us have disordered eating and about one in four have an eating disorder. So this is huge. And our disordered eating and eating disorder looks different than the regular population. And that's, it's important that we know those are two different things. And, um, a lot of disordered eating clinics are starting to recognize that too, and are starting to bring in people with kind of that, um, with both expertise to, to kind of learn from, because this is something that is what's really unique to people with IBD is that, you know, the Hey everyone. Oh, there she is. Okay. Ashley, you froze for a second. Oh, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I think, I think Ashley may have froze. Ashley. Oh no. There you are. Okay. Okay. Am I back? You're back. Yes. If any of you can't hear me, just type in the chat. So I don't want to be, um, I don't want you to miss out on whatever we're talking about. So just let me know. Yeah. So all that to say disordered eating and eating disorders look really different with IBD. And so we need to take a careful approach that considers the normal fears that come about through having pain with food. All right, Rebecca. So what the research says, so this is in relation to, you know, what do we do for our nutrition? So this diagram came from the IOIBD. So it's the, um, it's a huge organization that did this study for um, inflammatory bowel disease. And they basically recommended, and as we see here on the chart on the left, Crohn's recommendations. So um, saturated fat and trans fat should be reduced, emulsifiers, carrageenans, artificial sweeteners, um, maltodextrins, and titanium dioxide should also be uh, reduced. And we should be increasing our intake of plants, so vegetables and fruits. 
So that was specifically for Crohn's recommendations. And for ulcerative colitis, a little bit, you know, not a lot of fiber has been um, really extensively researched in UC as, you know, in the same way that Crohn's disease has, but the literature does, does basically promise us that it's, it's going to be similar and that we, we definitely want to support the microbiome in the same way that we do for our Crohn's disease patients. So ulcerative colitis, definitely want to reduce your intake of red meat and processed meats, dairy fat, uh, palm and coconut oil, saturated fats and trans fats, emulsifiers, carrageenans, artificial sweeteners, maltodextrins, titanium di dioxide, and really focus on increasing your intake of omega-3 fatty acids coming from fish oils. Um, so, you know, omega-3s are going to be more anti-inflammatory while omega-6s are more pro-inflammatory. And so what we do know, and I, I actually was reading an article today, um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, so consuming consuming foods that are high in omega-6s, they tend to be more pro-inflammatory. And you know, those with ulcerative colitis, we have a lot of pro-inflammation. There's a lot of pro-inflammatory properties in our gut. And so it's really important that we kind of counteract this by consuming more omega-3 fatty acids. And so you can get it from things like fish, you can get it from walnuts, you can get it from olive oils. There's a little bit in avocado. Um, you know, there's a lot in, in flax seeds, there's some in chia seeds. So you can still get it from your foods. Um, that's in the event you are vegan. Um, so you can still get it from other sources. Um, we do know that, you know, in reference to coconut oil, palm oils, and dairy fats, these tend to be more inflammatory. They contain a, a component called myristic acid. And so this is not favorable to the gut. And so that's why we really want to reduce our intake of this. Same with red meat. Red meat is very hard to break down and digest. It takes a lot of energy to break this down. We also know that um, if your IBD is affecting your colon, then you know you are at an increased risk of colorectal cancer. And so the research keeps pointing to limiting your intake of red meat because it's protective against colorectal cancer. And it's kind of the same with these additives as well. You know, you don't want to. Um, consume a lot of processed items, lots of additives, especially these guys right here, the carrageenans and the emulsifiers, because these are gut irritants and this can trigger inflammation. Um, and again, we want to lower our intake of saturated fats and decrease those certain um, additives and preservatives that we had talked about. <clears throat> okay. So kind of like we had mentioned a little bit ago, so we wanna increase our intake of fruits and vegetables because that really is key, diversity is key. So, you know, something that I like to ask our patients is um, to name 10 different uh, vegetables. And, you know, we go well and beyond those 10 different types. We actually, we've reached 20 in, in some of my patients. Um, if I haven't done that with you, at, with you yet, I will. So I will test you. Um, but we come, we come up with ideas together because, you know, sometimes we forget how many plants there are, you know, and we forget, oh yeah, that's right. There's not just red pepper, there's green, there's yellow, there's purple cabbage, there's, you know, red tomatoes, there's green tomatoes, there's asparagus, like we, there's bok choy, there's parsnips, there's all these different colored beets. So we sometimes forget just all these different things that we have, like all these different fruits, all these different vegetables that we can add into our diets. And so, the, the diversity is key because we want to, we really want to diversify our microbiome and therefore support our microbiome. Um, we also want to include whole grains because they tend to be very helpful. There's also um, nuts and seeds that we want to incorporate. There's some great antioxidants in some of these foods as well. <clears throat> we want to increase our intake of fiber. Now, the thing with fiber, that's, that's like a whole topic in itself, um, because we've heard a lot of things like don't eat fiber. Um, but it's really not about don't eat fiber. It's about where are you at specifically in your journey? And will fiber actually help you? Most likely the answer will be yes. It's just in a matter of 
you know, what texture, what's tolerable for you, what's kind of going on. Do we need a mixture of non-fibrous foods with a little bit of fibrous foods? So what can we kind of work with, right? So that's kind of, you know, that opens up a lot of other questions. Um, but in regards to fiber intake, it can really improve quality of life. Um, butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid, is a byproduct of fiber, and that really helps feed the colon. It supports supports the microbiome as well. And um, butyrate production can also help with the production of fecal uh, fecali bacteria and prosnitsi, and it helps lower inflammatory markers. So that's why we know that fiber is very powerful when, when we include that in our diet, especially when we have IBD. It's very um, anti-inflammatory. So symptoms versus inflammation. Um, you might be wondering, how do we do this without triggering symptoms? So before getting into the how, let's define symptoms and inflammation. So symptoms could include abdominal pain, it could be bloating, it could be diarrhea, constipation, mucus. Big one that I know a lot of us can relate to is rectal bleeding. Um, inflammation is detected by labs and stool tests. It is really important to understand um, what inflammation really is because, and I know Ashley can probably talk to you more about this, but you know, you can have a normal, let's say fecal calprotectin, which is an inflammatory marker, but then when the doc goes inside, they could still see some inflammation roaming around. So it's really important to not only look at one specific area. This is how unpredictable IBD can be, but don't let it, don't let it overcome you, right? because there's a lot of things that you can do. You can look at your labs, you can look at your scopes, um, you can understand your body and your symptoms and what's going on. Um, you know, when you do your scope, there's a pathologist there that can look at, you know, your history of your IBD and look at, look at it under a microscope. So there's a lot of ways to understand how the body is operating without just looking at one specific criteria. And, you know, you can have no inflammation, even your fecal, your fecal calprotectin, um, just kind of like what I said earlier, your fecal calprotectin can be completely normal, but you could still show a little signs of inflammation when they go in there. Um, and, you know, you can, you can have no inflammation also when they go inside, um, but be very symptomatic. So you can still have urgency, diarrhea, maybe feeling cramping here or there. Um, but you, but you don't have inflammation when they go in. So that's why, you know, your symptoms do not necessarily mean inflammation and you can have very, uh, high inflammation while you feel incredibly well, right? You're kind of going out there, you're doing your whole thing, living your life. And then you get a colonoscopy and it's like, oh, wow, you have inflammation going on. Then you may be thinking to yourself, but I don't feel anything. And so you know, that, that can be extremely frustrating, but that's why we have to stay on top of our scopes and we fix and help as much as we can with the inflammation to see what we can do about that. I'll give a real world example too. So several years ago, um, I, I didn't have any like symptoms. So I thought I would, must've been in remission and I did my scope and found out that I wasn't, um, so that they did see a lot of inflammation. Um, and then even just this past August. So interestingly, this August, I, I did fecal calprotectin test, which is typically a really good gauge as to where you're at with inflammation. And mine was really low it was a nine. The most recent one I did was a nine, which is good. So that means there's no inflammation present, but when we did the scope, she still saw, um, some signs of ulcerations and some, like, it looked like a looked like the rectum area was still trying to heal and still looked kind of bad. So that's the thing. That's the nuances of this is that it is important to kind of stay connected with your GI, even when you feel good and, and make sure that you're testing and, and looking for inflammation and doing regular scopes as needed. Um, cause it can just get kind of, kind of tricky to evaluate just based on how you feel, how your, you see your Crohn's is doing. So just wanted to share that. So, oh, oh, I wasn't sure actually. <laughs> um, so symptoms versus inflammation. When a food triggers your symptoms, so let's say I'll give myself, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give you a, a real, real life scenario as well. 
So I had brown rice the other day and boy, I woke up in the middle of the night in excruciating pain. Um, and so just because that happened, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm inflamed. That's not necessarily what that means. It could just be that it's, it's a trigger. It's something that triggers something, but it doesn't mean that you're going, you're, you're not getting into a flare. So just remember that inflammation is not the same as irritation. So when a food triggers that symptom, it doesn't mean that it caused your IBD, right? So it's not that one thing that caused it. It doesn't mean that you're in a flare up and it doesn't mean this is a big one that's causing harm. So it may feel like that it's causing harm and it's like stabbing you and you're like, what is going on? Um, but just remember to tell yourself, it doesn't mean I'm getting to a flare. It doesn't mean that I'm incredibly inflamed right now. It doesn't mean that it's causing harm because remember that your symptoms does not necessarily mean inflammation. Now, here's the other important piece, but this also doesn't mean that nutrition and food we eat don't matter or that they don't play a role because they do. Nutrition plays a huge role in our journey. Okay? It also plays a huge role in treating the inflammation and to lower inflammation. And it also doesn't mean that food patterns, while food patterns certainly do, they do matter, but we can't always tell with symptoms alone. So we can't rely. So the, the biggest message here is that we can't, we can't rely on our symptoms alone to determine how we're doing, right? Just how our chronic illness is. We, we can't, we can't rely on our symptoms because it's just not, it's not valid enough right? We, we just can't do that. And that's why we have different avenues and different areas to look at to make sure that we are in remission, that we are healing, or that perhaps we have still some lingering inflammation, or we need to be on a stronger medication so that the, you know, the, mu the mucosal healing can begin and all these things that, that we're doing um, that we want to stay on top of. So just a really important thing to remember is there is a difference between symptoms versus inflammation. Yeah, that was a good breakdown. And th this is kind of why, um, with our patients we work with, we don't typically start with things like food journals. Like we're not trying to identify the thing always typically we're kind of going big picture and then we're kind of narrowing down, um, to help you further. But, um, if you're trying to do a food journal to kind of figure out what it is that's causing things, it just usually ends in frustration. <laughs> I would start with like the general guidelines that we shared um, really focusing on, are you getting enough of the things you need? Are you staying away from, you know, long-term inflammatory triggers in focusing there before ever doing a food journal? So tips for reducing symptoms. Number one tip. I love this tip. Go low and go slow. So never go from zero to a hundred. And that's just with anything, you guys, like that could just be like, you know, going for a workout when it's been a really long time, you do not want to start running a marathon, right? Um, you want to go really low and slow. And that's the same with fiber. Um, because here's the thing, when you go really quickly with it, your body's not used to it. So anything that your body's not used to, it's going to react. You kind of think of a car, let's say you haven't turned your car on in a year or so. Right. And then all of a sudden you turn it on and let's say this car is a race car. All of a sudden, you know, you're thinking I'm going to go so fast with this car. I'm going to race this car. And then the car just like breaks down on you and you're like, wait, what? So it's kind of the same with your body. You don't want to go from zero to hundred because you're going to react, whether it be diarrhea, whether it be some cramping, whether it be some discomfort, whatever it is, you want to go very slow with it so that your body can become more acclimated to what you're doing and the changes that you're doing. Give yourself time. Food intolerances can change over time. I'm very happy to say that at one point I could not tolerate chocolate and now I can have chocolate in moderation, of course, but I can have it. Yeah, because awesome. yeah, I'm like super excited about it. Um, you know, food intolerances can change over time. So just because that one food didn't work out for you, maybe when you were in your flare or getting out of your flare, it doesn't necessarily mean that down the road you can never have it again. So Another reason why maybe you don't want to keep a food journal because then you create these food rules of, oh no, I cannot eat that again. But sometimes it could be helpful because you can revisit some of those foods and say, you know what, I'm going to try this food out and see how I feel now with it. 
So just remember that these food intolerances can change over time. And really important, try changing the way you have the food. So, you know, I know that when I look at a thing of kale, I'm just like, whoa, I can't, I could never see my body actually breaking this down because it just looks way too complicated. So instead of having it raw, try sauteing it, massaging it can really help loosen it up and make it a lot easier for digestion, maybe putting it in a smoothie that can also help. Um, raw almonds, raw almonds can definitely be a little bit tougher to break down. So the alternative would be to have almond butter smoother, a little bit easier on the gut. You can put it in a smoothie. So probably easier to tolerate rather than having those raw almonds. Plus sometimes we, we forget how many raw almonds we're having because we just kind of grab some and just kind of eat it. So we tend to forget, you know, how much we're actually having. Um, beans, another thing too. So if you want to cook your beans longer to make them softer, definitely makes it easier to tolerate. Another idea, instead of having whole beans, let's say you're not ready for that just yet, an alternative to, to beans would be hummus, right? Or like a bean dip or something like that. So you're still getting the fiber. Um, and also adding baking soda can help. And then kale, we talked a little bit about massaging the kale and definitely destemming the kale. Kind of the same with spinach and even arugula. Sometimes the stems can be pretty long. So if you just kind of take a bunch and just cut it, cut the stems, that could be very helpful. Um, and then long-term, what we do know is that fiber can help decrease um, inflammation along with medication. So we know you need both medication and nutrition. It's never one or the other to help lower inflammation. And long-term, we know that we can help correct deficiencies. So remember that when you are able to lower your inflammation, your body's able to absorb better and when it's absorbing better, it's able to correct some of those deficiencies. That's why maybe when you're in a flare, you have some anemia, but then as you start to heal, as your body heals, ulcers kind of heal, inflammation goes down, absorption is better, and you're able to take some vitamins if needed, um, you know, you're able to absorb those and, um, and correct those deficiencies. So really important to, to remember. I wanted to add to uh, the, the reasoning behind what we're saying is that, so the studies that look at tolerance, they're looking at when we decrease this, the particle size is what it says. So we're kind of making it into a more, we're breaking down some of the fibers a little bit further. That's the thing that tends to help with tolerance in IBD. And I'll also say there is, um, an interesting study that came out this year, just in May that, that actually looked at the phytonutrients in foods, which are, they're like plant compounds that have a lot of benefits. So a part of that diversity type diversity stuff we talked about earlier, but what they found was that when we cut or shred or turn into a smoothie, we actually increase some of the phytonutrients. So the, the beneficial compounds in plants. And I thought that was really interesting. So they looked at carrots, for example, so cut carrots, it it doubled them. Whereas shredded car carrots, it was about five to seven times the phytonutrients. And then, so I don't think they looked at blending, but I imagine that if you take it further and blend it further, that maybe that would actually improve the nutrition content a bit more. So I think that's great because you get better tolerance, but then you also get the added benefit of your increasing the phytonutrient content. And I know someone asked me recently about why that is. Um, I, I did look into it in terms of why it actually increases. And I think it has more to do with like plants in general. So plants produce more antioxidants when they're exposed to stress. It's how they combat stress. So the, in, I guess that happens too, after the fact. So when we're cutting or changing, it, they can actually still continue to increase some of the, um, really good nutrients in, in there beyond just the vitamins, but we're looking at more um, phytonutrients. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then the other thing I was going to say is, um, I got some emails from people that looked at this slide in particular and were able to expand their diet just based on this loan. So they had some thoughts about foods that they couldn't have. Um, but this, this slide challenged them and they, they actually included, you know, things like beans and spinach that they had been avoiding for a while and were able to tolerate it and actually started feeling better. So I know it sounds really simple, but yeah, don't underestimate it. Cause it could be really helpful. 
And um, I probably won't go through all of these, but yeah, just to give you some insights as to kind of the stuff we see when we incorporate a good holistic nutrition plan that incorporates both the dietary stuff, um, targeted supplementation and medication. Uh, we worked with someone named, her name was Sue, and we were able to see symptom reduction in her and inflammation reduction. So a lot of times we don't get people that want to do stool tests before and after, um, but we did with her and she saw her fecal calprotectin go down from 140 to 30, which is pretty incredible for such a short period of time. So usually that marker doesn't come down till like six months. Um, but her doctor was really excited about that change. And really the only thing that changed for her was that she incorporated a really good nutrition plan. Um, so it can be really powerful. And she had been trying to conceive for a while and recently was able to conceive. Cause really, if you, if that is on your radar, um, getting to remission is really important when it comes to fertility and trying to have a child, you want to, you want to have an immune system that is prioritizing fertility, but you kind of have to calm down the immune system to, to be able to conceive. Uh, but yeah, for her, she, she had 15 bowel movements a day. She had a lot of bleeding and anemia. We worked on the anemia and once she was able to get the anemia under control, that really helped her. Um, she had trouble with particularly including iron, um, which is a struggle for a lot of people because it can cause nausea and, or constipation in some people. Um, but we changed up the iron and we gave her a more gentle iron and combined it with something else to help. And she was able to tolerate that, which really helped. Um, and then we also discovered low vitamin D she hadn't, she did not run that. So we had to ask and advocate on her behalf to get her doctor to run that so that we could see where things are at. Um, and we're glad we did because she was low. And that's something that we know is a big factor or roadblock sometimes with IBD patients is that we need vitamin D to help with inflammation reduction. Um, it is involved in that and it gets low when we're inflamed. So, so we worked on both of these things. Um, you know, in our practice, we do, we use as many tools as we can that we know are effective. Um, so we don't like people to have to be on a million different supplements. Cause obviously that's not great quality of life. <laughs> um, but we try to, we try to be strategic about what things we're recommending and making sure that they're for what we're trying to accomplish. And so we did a combination approach of some food strategies, some of which we talked about some other things that were more specific to her. And then, you know, this is what we found. We saw her inflammation go down. Um, she still reaches out to us and tells us how she's doing. And I think the thing that something most people don't come to us to, but something that happens when you work with, with us is that we worked on the fear of food part. And now she has a lot of confidence when she goes out to eat, she doesn't feel as stressed. Um, I think that's huge. I think the stress part can really weigh down on your quality of life and can weigh down on your ability to go out and do things. And uh, that's something I'm most proud of is really helping people with the stress part because it doesn't have to be stressful. It doesn't have to make your life harder. And it really shouldn't because any nutrition strategy, if, if a nutrition strategy is helpful, but doesn't improve your quality of life, because then you're stressed about everything is probably not a good strategy. <laughs> that's a good rule of thumb. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention her in particular, cause she, she's a good example of what's possible. And then my other favorite one was, um, this is not his, none of these names are real, but, um, the favorite one that I had was there was a guy who worked with us for about six to eight months and he didn't have a lot of, um, a lot of foods he was eating is all at all. It was just kind of the bare minimum, the five foods. I know some of you might be able to relate to what that's like. Um, he, he basically said, I remember seeing him on the first meeting. He was really underweight, really tired. Couldn't even do the whole meeting. Um, and then by the end of it, he was able to, he was able to do a lot more. He was able to interact more and be present for his family. And I think that was really huge. And then, you know, what he described, he described it as he couldn't, he couldn't take out the trash at the beginning. And the day that we were meeting at the end, he was, he was moving a fridge and moving heavy things with ease. And that just speaks to just like the quality of life aspect. Like when you're feeling really bad, you're limited so much. And, um, if you can bring in a few strategies that can help you and kind of help kind of dig you out of the hole a little bit, 
um, and help your meds work better. I mean, that's where nutrition really is helpful is just helping what you're already doing, help that just be amplified. So I just want to check in with everybody and see kind of how everybody's feeling. Um, is there anything that you would implement from kind of what you learned today? Is there anything that you learned or that resonated? Go ahead and type it in the chat. I don't know if anybody has access. Hopefully people have access to chat. I haven't seen anything show up yet. Um, yeah. How can we support you? So we have a lot of free resources currently. So we do these every single month. We have, um, Instagram occasionally we'll get on lives. Uh, we have a podcast that says soon, but we actually just launched it. Uh, so it's called gut feelings podcast, and we are about to launch a library for Crohn's and colitis. Yeah, we have a lot of options. Um, we also have, you also have the ability to work with us. We kind of are in and out of waiting list with that. Um, currently we're, we're open to seeing patients. Um, so yeah, if that interests you, feel free to, I'll go ahead and put that in the chat too. You're welcome to schedule a call and talk about it. And we can go ahead and open up to questions too, if anybody has any. So we have 11 people in here. I'm not sure if the chat is working or not. I see a hand. <laughs> yeah, I had a quick question. Um, so if a food triggers symptoms like once, it's not bad. At what point, like if this food continues to trigger symptoms and you try changing like how you eat it and it's still causing problems, like at what point does it transition from like, it can still be good um, to like, maybe you should cut this out of your diet. I guess, well, one thing that comes to mind is like, is it, is it a food allergy? You know, that's, there's so many factors to consider. Um, yeah. Cause if it's a food allergy, if you haven't rolled that out, that would be maybe the first place to start. Um, do you, what food is it? There's not a specific food. I'm just like, I'm just getting started in my journey and changing my diet drastically. So like, was just curious, like, uh, if something like that comes up, like, how do you address it? I would, I would also suggest to like, first off, what is the food? Um, I would also look into the quantity of it. So remember that with fiber, if you're changing your diet drastically, um, remember to go low and slow, because when you go from zero to a hundred, you will feel something, you know, it, it could be, you could be symptomatic to it because you're not used to it. And again, it depends on the food that you're consuming. So, you know, maybe if you can't do a full cup of it, maybe trying, um, you know, a quarter of a cup, quarter of a cup to it, you know, and seeing if, you know, how is that for you? Or just kind of, um, I would, I would take note of it, you know, I would probably take note of it and just kind of keep it in the back of your mind, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can never have this food again. So that's just something important to mention is that it doesn't make it, you know, a bad food or stay away from it forever and ever. Um, that maybe it's just something to revisit or change up the quantity if needed. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, something that we've seen, I've seen with people is, time too. So like in working on your gut health. So as you get more stable with the IBD, improve the diversity over time, what we've seen is that your sensitivities and tolerances will change as well. I mean, that, that checks out from a gut perspective too, in terms of what's going on. Um, so as you improve things, you should see a lot of things that you couldn't tolerate that you may be able to tolerate. And I'd give it like maybe six eight months. And feel free to anybody else speak your question too. Otherwise we'll go off of the chat. Um, so we have Elizabeth who says when it comes to eating out, how do you find restaurants that don't have all the emulsifiers, carrageens, maltodextrins? Good question. <laughs> uh, Rebecca, anything come to mind? Um, well, the reality is you don't know. You don't know 
what's in their food because remember that restaurants are in the business to make your food taste good and their biggest concern is not so much of health it's first really taste making sure that it tastes good and they kind of do whatever they can do to make it taste good um but with that being said what you can do is you can um you can call ahead and figure out, you know, what is the restaurant that you're looking at and calling ahead and asking them how they prepare their foods. Do they marinate them? Do they put any dressings in there? Um, there have been times where if I get like a turmeric latte or like a golden milk latte, I'll ask them what kind of milk they're using and I'll have them show me the milk that they're using so I can look for carrageenan or maltodextrin. Um, so you can do those things. You can kind of call, be a little bit proactive about it and just, you know, and it's also okay to ask questions, to ask your server questions, you know, how is something prepared? If they don't know, have them talk to the kitchen, they'll get back to you. Maybe you can even talk to a manager if you want, and that's okay too, you know, you know, feel, feel okay to, to talk to somebody if that's what makes you feel um, more comfortable. Yeah, and I was gonna say too, um, you know, sometimes I don't feel up for tell, talking about my IBD, you know, um, so if I'm feeling that way, I might just say, Hey, I've got some a food allergy or food intolerance. I want to be sure I want to kind of see what the ingredients are. Like, do you mind sharing? And people understand what allergies are. <laughs> Sometimes people don't understand what IBD is and maybe you don't feel like explaining it. So maybe just talking about it that way can also be helpful. Um, but yeah, looking at restaurants too, that are more likely to have things for you. So I know there's a place out here called like true foods and places that are geared more towards, um, health focused or, um, allergy friendly. Usually those places will be a little bit more transparent about what they have. So I think transparency is key. So if you see a menu with lots of, with the allergies notated, usually they're going to be more inclined to have answers about what's in their food. But the, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. And then Crystal says, what are the best strategies for reducing bloat? Good question. Um, I mean, the question too is we want, what we want to know is what's, where's the origin of the bloat? Is the bloat coming from, like, you want to look at the big picture first and foundational stuff, obviously. I mean, there's, there's quick things like, you know, things like peppermint tea comes to mind uh, bitters and stuff like ginger that help kind of break down gas particles. But here's what you want to know is like, that's a great starting point, but you want to, you want to dig a little deeper and find out what's actually going on. Is there something more to that picture? Is it coming about from diversity in the gut? Is it coming about from, did you have an antibiotic recently? I mean, there's so many questions that come to mind there. What do you think, Rebecca? Um, yeah, I was thinking the same, you know, strategies as you were saying, as far as the teas go. Um, I know that yoga is pretty good too. Certain stretches are really good to help with, uh, with bloat. Um, I would like to look at, you know, kind of your meal times, like how often are you eating? Are you going long periods of time without eating? How are your stress levels? Are you shallow breathing, which can incorporate more air, which can contribute to more bloat? Um, you know, kind of looking at temperatures too. Um, like heat, for instance, I've noticed that, um, a lot of heat can also contribute to bloat in some people. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think as far as strategies go, I think doing the peppermint tea, um, you know, looking at your meal times, um, meditation could be good to help with stress management, ginger, just like what, um, Ashley was saying. I think that's a good place to start and seeing what that looks like. Also, do not drink fluids while you're eating. You either <laughs> want to drink a little bit before or after. Yeah. And in cardamom too. So chewing on cardamom pods or having cardamom, uh, that can help with nausea and bloating. Um, yeah, I think that's where I'd start, but then you want to figure out in order for us to give, like if we were to give a probiotic recommendation, there are some that are really effective for bloating, but we kind of have to know where the origin is before deciding on what would be the best route. And Katie's asking urgency is 
the biggest issue. Are there any specific dietary changes that you would implement? We could really do a whole nother, a whole nother hour on both the bloating and, and urgency, but do you have anything that really comes to mind with urgency? Um, yeah. I mean, are there any specific dietary changes? That's so hard. <laughs> Yeah. It's hard to narrow it down to like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, urgent, if urgency is your biggest issue, is it coming from your IBS? Is it coming from your IBD? That's the first place where I would start. Like, do you have a history of IBS? Is it because you have some lingering inflammation going on? Is that, is that contributing to, to the urgency? Um, so it's kind of the same with like the bloat, like what's the root cause? What's the why? Once we get to the why, then we can kind of navigate that, you know, like, are you on the right medications? Um, what's, you know, is there an imbalance of macronutrients in your diet? Um, yeah, there, there could be a lot, there could be a lot there, but my first, my first question is, is it, is it coming from your IBD or is it something else? That's what I would want to know. And, um, and Katie, I would say, Increasing soluble fibers is something we say a lot. We actually use fibers to help with urgency, but, um, specific types. So like soluble and resistant starches are usually what we incorporate, but that's only a starting point. Um, we probably want to support you a little bit more. Um, I'm happy to chat with you and crystal as well about, you know, some other strategies over the phone, if you want. And also something too, because the brain gut pathway, that bi-directional pathway. Also, I like to understand stress levels because I know like right now I can tell myself that I'm so stressed and then I can actually make myself go use the restroom. And I know I'm not the only one that can do that. Here. Yes. So, right? <laughs> you get nervous I, about something, you go to the bathroom, you're like, oh my God, I gotta go. So, you know, it just, you know, that's why I like to know where it's coming from too. I, I will admit to you before, before any webinar, like webinars, doctor's offices, oh, and doctor's TSA offices. line, the TSA, oh, right, line. the TSA line. Right. Right. And that's, that's somebody who, I mean, I'm, I don't have any inflammation currently. I'm in remission other than some lingering things, but you know, I, it, it still gets me. And a lot of that for, for me, it is very much, um, the brain gut connection. I, I know because those are stressful environments, things that bring back memories, uh, bring back memories of urgency. And sometimes even just the memory of urgency and, or, or knowing that I'm not near a bathroom, that's enough to put my body in this fight or flight state. Whereas if I'm at home, I'm not having urgency at all. It's, it's just like the, you know, a lot of this is, can be for some trauma, like you could have trauma from your IBD from just like all the things we go through. Right. And and your body remembers these things. And thought, so yeah, urgency is a, a there's a lot, a lot there word, to talk about. Even hearing that word urgency, it's like, Ooh, yes. <laughs> you know? So relatable. Yeah. 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 Oh my goodness. Um, okay. Elizabeth is asking, are there co good comprehensive list of inflammatory foods versus anti-inflammatory foods? Um, I mean, a lot of what we talked about is a good starting place. Um, that what we would like to say is not inflammatory foods, but inflammatory dietary patterns, because it's the pattern, not the food. If you have coconut oil one time, you're not going to have inflammation from that. Like that's going to trigger a flare. But if you have a consistent pattern in your diet of things like coconut oil, things like lots of meats and not enough fruits and vegetables. If you have that pattern over time, what we'll see is a gut bacteria change that puts you more at risk for flares. And we do see higher rates of flares in people that are like that. Um, and we've seen too, in our patients that, you know, when we get them stable and let's say they go back to former dietary patterns, that's when the flare kind of comes back. So we have seen a lot of those relapses when the diet starts to shift kind of like a seesaw, right? Mm -hmm. Um, it's not either or black and white, it's the pattern. So anything you can do to consistently shift the balance a bit in a favorable direction is where you want to go. Um, so there's not, 
I wouldn't say that there's foods that are specifically inflammatory. It's patterns of foods. So like, um, fast food intake, for example, you know, there's a 390% increase. If you have that four times a week, you know, four times a week and, or more, and for many weeks, right. We do see a 390% increased risk of IBD and flares. So we know that it's linked to that, but it's not like, and I know that's a spectrum too, right? It's like, well, what are you having at the restaurant? I mean, that matters as well, <clears throat> but in general, it's like, it's those patterns. And so if you have coconut oil three times a week, but you have a lot of fiber in the diet and you know, everything else looks good, that's going to be different than having multiple factors that are involved with flare risk. So, um, I hope that kind of points you in the right direction. Do you have anything you would add? No, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Hannah asks, is there anything you can do to help with being hungry, but not having an appetite for food? Yeah. So what comes to my mind is small, frequent meals. So, you know, not, um, overloading yourself with, you know, I got to eat this whole plate of food right now. Um, because you, you don't, you know, honor, honor how you're feeling in that moment. Um, I think doing small, frequent meals though, will, would be helpful instead of, you know, big, larger meals. And, and, um, you know, maybe if it's, even if that's, if that's too much for you, you know, if you make something, maybe having half of it now, and then the other half, like in an hour or so, where you build up a little bit more of an appetite. And the other question is, you know, why don't you have an appetite? Are you inflamed right now? Is something going on? Do you need an appetite stimulant, a little bit of, of support of whatever it is? So looking into those things, um, something else too are shakes. So if you do like protein shakes, like Orgain or Own, um, those are really great too. They're plant-based uh, shapes and packed with a lot of nutrition. So something like that, it's better to do something instead of not doing anything. So you want to definitely want to try to have something. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, something that comes to mind to me is when I was experiencing kind of the more lack of hunger and a flare, I, I didn't realize it, but I had kind of this lingering nausea that was mild enough to where it wasn't like, it wasn't overpowering. So I almost forgot about it, you know? Um, so if you've got, I would tune into how you're feeling a little bit too, and kind of check in with yourself and see what does that feel like? Um, is it that you're not getting hunger cues or is it that you have kind of an upset stomach or a little bit of nausea? Uh, that might be helpful in terms of figuring out what tools would be useful because there are some things that help with nausea, uh, like cardamom, cardamom and ginger. I've had the most success with cardamom, um, in terms of the nausea part and then liquids, like Rebecca said, liquids can be really helpful because they don't signal signal fullness in the same way that food does. Mm -hmm. So if you're having trouble with fullness and feeling full very quick, like in a flare, then sometimes liquids can sort of override that and help you, you know, in that place of not having an appetite. Yeah. And it's also not as strong, you know, like when you make food, it's like, and you're not really feeling hungry. It's hard to prepare something when you're not really feeling it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I know like, you know, during my flare up too, I would have like banana, I'll have like applesauce, you know, a little bit of yogurt, like just something that can kind of, you know, I could just have a little bit of something. Um, but I, I really do recommend the shakes if you're having a hard time eating, um, just to get, to get something in you, to get that nutrition in you. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, so Elizabeth's asking, how often do you recommend eating throughout the day? I think it really just depends on the person. I can't really give a full yeah. on generalization. <laughs> it's, it's too individualized. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of that, that plays there. Yeah. What do you think? I, of I would say when you're hungry, but, um, a lot of us don't have the same hunger cues and that makes it really difficult. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, 
it, at least the, at least the, the normal three meals, if not more. And if you're in a flare, that's going to vary. You're going to probably want your body can be a little bit more, have a higher need when you're in a flare. So that's a hard question. Yeah. So yeah, these are really good questions. Um, so I'll just wait a few more minutes and see if there's any, any other last minute. And I'm also going to put our link in the chat. If you want to, if you want to schedule a call to chat, chat with me, I'm more than happy to, to continue the conversation and maybe help you come up with the next step. And, and really for me, it's, it's mostly about connecting IBD patients with a good, a good person or strategy to help them with their nutrition. So it doesn't have to be us. I'm, we refer all the time to other people. If we feel like another person would be a better fit. So, um, so don't feel bad if you, if you click it, um, and you don't, you know, you don't want to, um, you know, work with us or you have any doubts, it's totally okay. Um, yeah, I just want to help. And yeah, I think a lot of you possibly came from Instagram, but if you are not following us on Instagram, we are, I'll put the, our handle in the chat. Did everybody, is there anybody that did not come from Instagram? Just curious. Hmm. Okay, so that's our handle at Crohn's and Colitis Dietitians. Yeah, did did people come from Instagram or did you find us on Google? How did you hear about us? I know a few of you. <laughs> I know a few of you from from Instagram or that work with us, but Google, Instagram, Insta. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Okay, oh, mostly yeah. Instagram. Mm -hmm. Very awesome. nice. Well, great. So thanks for hanging out with us and learning about nutrition. And yeah. uh, feel free to connect after we and we plan to do more of these. So stay connected and we'll continue to share what we know. And if you have an idea for a next another um, webinar, we're totally open to what everybody wants to learn about. So yeah, nice. please let us know. <laughs> And listen to our podcast. It's yes. Fun. Gut feelings. I'm going to type in the chat. It's not totally nutrition all the time. It's a little bit of more real life with IBD, but a lot of people can appreciate that. <laughs> all right. Take care, everybody. Bye everyone.